Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Santinetti. On today's Put Your Face in the Torah, we're still in Psalms 119, believe it or not. We're at, we're at the 116th verse. We've been working since verse 1. It's been a tedious but very um, rewarding study. I've been um, looking at every word, and it's just, it's just a blessing to know that we can do that, that we have enough material today to look at every word of the Word of God and to look uh, to see what it's saying. You know, the Bible only has one interpretation. If we look at it, it only has one interpretation. Who was it written to? Why was it written to them? And, and how it was given to them, you know, the prophets, the kings that were righteous, all those that were living according to the word of God were able to speak the word of God to their generation, pretty much like today. So it's very much important that we study the word of God to bring a healthy perspective. I'm going to say that again. To bring a healthy perspective of the word of God to a generation that is unhealthy. A generation that's living in darkness. And even though we are Christians, we are still here and we experience all kinds of things because we're still living in a dark world. And if it wasn't that way, then you know what? We would not have any war. But the Bible tells us that we're at war. And therefore, we should put on the, or actually keep on, let's just put it that way. We should put it on and keep on the armor of God. Remember that this word right here, this is the only thing you have to defeat the darkness through the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we live except by the Holy Spirit? How do we survive except by the Word of God? So let's, let's dig in now to verse 116 of Psalm 119. And here we go. It says, Uphold me according to your word that I may live, and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Uphold me according to thy word, that I may live, and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Now, these are pretty uh, difficult words to understand, especially <clears throat> the last part. Let me not be ashamed of my hope. But we're going to be touching on that in a few minutes. So now understand that upholding in the ways of God should be the desire of the Christian not to slip and not to let our ears move away from the word of God, and not to put our arms down in a time when there is warfare. We know that because of the afflictions that happen to the righteous, we must remain faithful and let God do his work. And so we have to also see that as Christians, we have a responsibility to live a life that is righteous. We're not perfect, but we should aim for that which is righteous. Aim for that which is perfected in us by the Holy Spirit. You know, once I was reading and the Bible says that <clears throat> Jesus said, um, you know, to have a per uh, to be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect in heaven. And I was taken back. I said, well, how can I do that? I mean, the Father is perfect. And I began to understand as the Holy Spirit inspired his word inside of me. And that is that he wants us to have a heart that is bent toward him. When your heart has a desire, that one single desire, out of all the desires in our heart, that one desire that is stronger than all desires to please Him, then we become perfect in Him. But that can only happen when we accept Christ on the, uh, His sacrifice on the cross and the Holy Spirit comes to live in our heart, then there's a desire for righteousness. Remember that the world does not desire the righteousness of God. Although they, mo they may have some moral values and they do good, they can never hunger for the righteousness of God without the Holy Spirit. They can never hunger for the Word of God without the Holy Spirit. You have professors that teach this Word, but yet they themselves are not saved. I've seen this and I've heard about it, and it's really a, a scary thing. So now he says, uphold me, and this way... No matter what difficulties you're going through, your prayer is uphold me, Lord. Because we're going to face discouragements and we're going to we're going to face trying times and we're going to see that sometimes we even fall out of the way, but our hope is always in God and he is the one that sustains us. 
He is the sustenance of our life. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. But understand that everyone that comes to God must believe that he is, meaning I am, and that he is a rewarder of them that seek him diligently. And so the word diligently means exactly that. You have to be earnest in your desire to seek God and to know what he says to us in his word. Uphold me. Now let's look at <clears throat> the word uphold. And it simply means, excuse me, whoa, getting there. <laughs> All right. The word uphold is the word samar, samar, okay? I'm having a little, okay, give me one second. Still dealing with software. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you, Lord. So the word samar is interesting because the words are made, the, let, the word is made of three Hebrew letters, and we know that it is the, the semech. Remember, that's what we're studying right now. Semech is the, is the word that we're studying, uh, or the letter. And uh, it, is, it is the mem, which it is the, the water, okay? And it is the the. the the K in ours, the cough, which represents a strong, close hand or a hand that has been carved out. Okay, so what does that mean in essence? Well, remember that Semech represents at least three basic things for now. It represents protection. It represents support and memory. And here is the word uphold, support me. I need your support. I need you to establish and help me to stand and to rest inside of you. Now, remember, these Three letters represents the support of water that comes from a strong hand. Remember that the shepherd leads the sheep to a place where they can rest and they can drink and they can refresh themselves. So here he's saying, help me to be sustained. Help me to rest. Help me to lean upon you. Okay. So he says, uphold me according to thy word. And the word here is Imrah. Now, there's times that you run into the word, for example, the bar, which we have explained before, but here is Imra, and we have spoken of this word uh, during this time of study, and it means a chain of words blended together to form sentences. Again, a chain of words blended together to form sentences. What's interesting is that at least over 400 times in the Bible, we see, thus saith the Lord. When God speaks, we need to listen. I am not really keen on a lot of people who say God said this and, and God said that and he did not say that. And, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of Christians that hear someone says, you know, the Lord told me this and this and this and this. And if you don't know the word, how will you judge it? You know, one day I'm going to write a book called the, the Thousand Things That God Did Not Say. Because I hear people say things all the time that is so unbiblical, and that's because they are ignorant of the Word of God. Remember, ignorance is not a bad word, but it's not a good thing. And so here, let's go to Joshua, and let's see what happens here. Because his hope is in God. Israel has sinned, and they have also broken my covenant, which I have commanded them, and have even taken of the cursed things, and have also stolen and pretended falsely, and they have even put, put it among their own self. Now, we're going to go back to this, but I want you to remember what's happening here. At, at the time when they went out to war, they were going against a city called Ai. And it's interesting that today, and that's spe it's spelled A-I, and it's interesting that today AI is represents a large part of what we live in a society is called artificial intelligence. We see that in 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 computers. We see computers talking to us now and do you know Alexa and, ex, and et cetera. This these are all artificial intelligence. And they were going, now I'm not saying that this was a city of artificial intelligence, but it's interesting how God told them to send only three thousand men. Because they were small. And yet, when they went against them, the Bible says that they fled from the people at Ai. They fled from them. And you say, wait a minute, there was 3,000 people. God says only take 3,000 because they're small people. You don't have to worry about it. But yet, excuse me, they ran from Ai. They ran from them. You know why? Because they had someone in the whole camp of God took something that did not belong to them. 
And so they, and, and this, the, but, uh, but check this out. All he took was a robe and some and some silver things and some other things uh, uh, of the city, and he put it under his tent. And the name of this person is called Achan. And I always say that the camp of God was Achan because of Achan. And you know what? Because of this one thing that he did, Israel began to lose the battle. And in losing the battle, they killed 36 of their men. I killed 36 of, of the Israelites. Watch this now. They ran from them, and now Joshua goes before God, and he tears his clothes, and he goes before the Ark of the Covenant, and he begins to talk to God. Mm, wow. Now look what God tells him after this. He's there praying, and God says in verse 10 of Joshua 7, And, jo and, and Jehovah said, or Yahweh, said to Joshua, Get up, why do you lie on your face this way? In other words, why are you here praying when you know what you should do? Sometimes we know what we should do, but we don't do what we know we should do. And so here, watch, let's go back because we're going to stay here for a second. Let's go back and he says, uphold me according to thy word that I may live. Now the word live here is the word he, and it means uh, the, the picture of he actually represents an empty stomach, a stomach that is is famished. And you know, when you're famished and you're hungry and you're weak, and man, when you get that food going down, there is life. You're revived. That's what the word life here means. So un understand that being famished is not a good thing. For we know also in Lamentations 4, 4, it says that the tongue of the suckling child cleaves to the root of his mouth, the root of his mouth for thirst. The young children beg bread, but there is no man to break it unto them. Now understand that there's something going on. There's a famine going on. And here in this particular verse of scripture, uphold me according to thy word. He is going through affliction. He is going through something. But the last part of this is where we need to really focus in. So let's look for the sake of, of the word. Let's look at the word life again. And it means he. And there are two pictures here. And is that of a circumference and a powerful force, a powerful hand. And he says, I need you to close me in and give me life. But here he is saying, I'm famished. I'm going through. Watch this now. That I may live and not, and and, and listen, and let me not. Now the, the word there simply is, be, don't let me be without. Be ashamed. Be ashamed. The word bush means ashamed. Bush. And it represents a drying up of a land or a stream, and we're going to go back to Joshua, plant, and it means to every uh, vegetation that dries up, and even a place where a lot of fish were, when the water is gone, it begins to stink. And that's what shame is. To God, it stinks. Now, how many know that when you're, going to, when you're going through something shameful, it stinks? But here he says, do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Now, wait a minute. How can we be ashamed of our hope? This man is, is, is actually praying a healthy prayer. He is saying, Lord, don't let me go out of your word. Watch this. Because when I move out of your word and I allow certain things in my life, they become the accursed thing. And this is what happened in the time of Joshua. Achan took things of the, the accursed things that he was not supposed to take out of the city of Ai. And so, therefore, he brought a curse upon all of Israel because he was not walking, I was not walking, excuse me, um, Achan was not walking according to the word of the Lord, and he put it under his tent. And so God tells Joshua, why are you praying here? Get up. And we know that God showed him where the sin was, and it was in Achan's tent, his house. And listen, what happened when is is actually is 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 so is painful because of what Achan did, his whole family died. They have, they were stoned to death because of what he did. The whole entire camp of Israel was suffering. And you know what? I when I think about sometimes how we get into situations. Watch this. And we hope in God. We always hope in God. But we know that we did wrong. And God always, as he does, works all things together for good. But not everything we do is God. And so, therefore, we should be 
honest enough to say, oh God, please don't let my hope in you be shamed. In other words, help me to live a life that I don't put myself in trouble. I know you're going to fix it, but help me to walk a straight line so that I can avoid these things so that my hope will not be shamed. Because the worst thing to do is when we get into trouble is to justify it by saying, oh, well, I guess it was God that did this. God cannot do evil. And so sometimes we put ourselves in a situation and we like to give God the credit. God doesn't deserve that credit. Because we put ourselves in a, in a situation where, watch this, where we say, well, my hope is in God. And sometimes, watch this, God allows us to go through something and even lose something. And our false hope is shamed. So even when we put our hope in God, God will sometimes show us a very important lesson on how not to give him credit for something that he did not do. And many times we do that. Remember that the end should never justify the means. Sometimes we go through something and we, we, we try to work it out for ourselves. And God says, you're only going to be shamed. He says, oh, Lord, please don't, don't let me be shamed in this. If we're walking outside of the word of God, we're going to pay for it. Now, let's look at us as a society. A society. Folks, there's coming a time when the church is not going to have the freedom it has now. It's going to be taken away. And we're going to suffer, and some of us are even going to suffer without food or having anything. You say, how can that be? Because we're disobedient, because we have walked away from the Torah. We have walked away from the Word of God, and we're going to see where the church really stands, where believers or those that say that they're believers really stand. Because this is going to be a time of great falling away, of especially religious people that have clung to the church thinking that they're saved, and they would never, watch this, they never had an experience with Christ. And if you think that can't happen, just next Sunday when you go to, uh, to church, look around you. Do you think that everyone in the congregation is going to be saved? We need to be very careful that we think that way. Not everyone is going to be saved. There are people who are going to be left behind who thought they were saved, who attached themselves to the vine, but never took life from the vine. That's why God cuts them off. And so we have to see that here in Joshua is a very important picture for us to understand that they went out to war and God told them to go out to war. And yet they were losing the war because of one person. What are you doing? What are you doing? Watch this. What are you doing in your life that can be a cursed thing? Can a Christian be cursed? We Listen. We can bring a lot of things into our life that curse the way that we do things or the way that we live. Sometimes we think, Lord, what's going on here? We need to check ourselves and say, God, is there something in my life that is a reproach? Is there something in my life that I'm not allowing you to flow and get the real blessing? And forget about us, like I said, trying to justify ourselves. The Bible says, watch this, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. Listen, through him, we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the, in the hope of the glory of God. Well, praise God for that. And not only, not only this, but we glory in affliction and also knowing that our afflictions work out patience. Oh, well, praise God for that. See, this is God's work working in us, that when he puts us through a trial, we grow. When he puts us through the trial, our hope will not be shamed. Watch this. Watch this now. And patience works out experience, and experience works out hope. So our hope is not shamed because we know that we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and we're kept by his power. But there are things that we do in our life, and because of this, we bring shame upon ourselves. And yet, listen, watch this. We try to turn this around and say, well, my hope is in God. I know he's going to work it out. Absolutely. But what do we do to put ourselves in a position that we hope with false hope? Because sometimes God is not going to deliver us fully from what we're going through until we learn the lesson. Because we put ourselves in danger. So I admire you today. And I pray, I admonish you today that you would follow the Lord and his word and stay on track. Think, listen, think carefully 
about where you're going to go and what you're going to do. How should you respond? All of these things are important because you can say one thing and put yourself in jeopardy. And God says, I didn't tell you to say that. I didn't tell you to do that. If we really want to walk in the spirit, it means that we walk according to his word and we're sensitive to what he wants to say or what he has to say. Hallelujah. One more verse of scripture and I'm out. Peter, therefore Christ has having suffered for us in, in the flesh, also arm yourselves with the same thought that he who suffered in the flesh has been made to rest from sin or has been done with sin. He is done with sin. He's, he died on the cross. He's done with sin. How should, what, what is our attitude? How should we live? I am done with this sin. I know sometimes we say something. We say, I'm not going to do this anymore. We wind, up, we wind up doing it. But do this. Continue to, to fight against it until you have the victory over it. Do not stop. Continue to move forward. Say, God, give me strength to get over this. Now watch this real quick. Let's go back to the scripture. Uphold me according to your word that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. This is a prayer for purity and simple guidance in the word so that when we do something, we don't have to be ashamed and say, God, I know you did this. Don't give God the credit for something he did not do. God bless you.